Chapter Six of the Sorrows of Satan by Marie Corelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I approached and examined the box he held. It was perforated with finely drilled holes for the admission of air, and within it lay a brilliant winged insect colored with all the tints and half tints of the rainbow. Is it alive? I asked. It is alive and has a sufficient share of intelligence, replied Rimenez. I feed it, and it knows me. That is the utmost you can say of the most civilized human beings. They know what feeds them. It is quite tame and friendly, as you perceive. And opening the case, he gently advanced his forefinger. The glittering beetle's body palpitated with the hues of an opal. Its radiant wings expanded and it rose at once to its protector's hand, and clung there. He lifted it out and held it aloft. Then shaking it to and fro lightly, he exclaimed, Off, sprite, fly, and return to me. The creature soared away through the room, and round and round the ceiling, looking like a beautiful iridescent jewel, the whir of its wings making a faint buzzing sound as it flew. I watched it, fascinated, till after a few graceful movements hither and thither, it returned to its owner's still outstretched hand, and again settled there making no further attempt to fly. There is a well-worn platitude which declares that, in the midst of life, we are in death, said the prince then softly, bending his dark, deep eyes on the insect's quivering wings. But as a matter of fact, that maxim is wrong, as so many trite human maxims are. It should be, in the midst of death, we are in life. This creature is a rare and curious production of death, but not, I believe, the only one of its kind. Others have been found under precisely similar circumstances. I took possession of this one myself in rather a weird fashion. Will the story bore you? On the contrary, I rejoined eagerly, my eyes fixed on the radiant bat-shaped thing that glittered in the light as though its veins were phosphorescent. He paused a moment, watching me. Well, it happened simply thus. I was present at the uncasing of an Egyptian female mummy. Her talismans described her as a princess of a famous royal house. Several curious jewels were tied round her neck and on her chest was a piece of beaten gold, quarter of an inch thick. Underneath this gold plate, her body was swathed round and round in an unusual number of scented wrappings, and when these were removed, it was discovered that the mummified flesh between her breasts had decayed away, and in the hollow or nest thus formed by the process of decomposition, this insect I hold now was found alive as brilliant in color as it is now. I could not repress a slight nervous shudder. Horrible, I said. I confess if I were you, I should not care to make a pet of such an uncanny object. I should kill it, I think. He kept his bright, intent gaze upon me. Why? he asked. I'm afraid, my dear Geoffrey, you are not disposed to study science. To kill the poor thing who managed to find life in the very bosom of death, is a cruel suggestion, is it not? To me, this unclassified insect is a valuable proof, if I needed one, of the indestructibility of the germs of conscious existence. It has eyes and the sense of taste, smell, touch, and hearing, and it gained these together with its intelligence out of the dead flesh of a woman who lived and no doubt loved and sinned and suffered more than four thousand years ago. He broke off, then suddenly added, All the same, I frankly admit to you that I believe it to be an evil creature. I do indeed. But I like it none the less for that. In fact, I have rather a fantastic notion about it myself. I am much inclined to accept the idea of the transmigration of souls. And so I please my humor sometimes by thinking that perhaps the princess of that royal Egyptian house had a wicked brilliant vampire soul, and that, here it is, a cold thrill ran through me from head to foot at these words, and as I looked at the speaker standing opposite me, in the wintry light, dark and tall, with the wicked brilliant vampire soul clinging to his hand, there seemed to me 
to be a sudden hideousness declared in his excessive personal beauty i was conscious of a vague terror but i attributed it to the gruesome nature of the story and determining to combat my sensations i examined the weird insect more closely as i did so its bright beady eyes sparkled i thought vindictively and i stepped back vexed with myself at the foolish fear of the thing which overpowered me it is certainly remarkable i murmured no wonder you value it as a curiosity its eyes are quite distinct almost intelligent in fact no doubt she had beautiful eyes said rimenez smiling she whom do you mean the princess of course he answered evidently amused the dear dead lady some of whose personality must be in this creature seeing that it had nothing but her body to nourish itself upon and here he replaced the creature in its crystal habitation with the utmost care i suppose i said slowly you in your pursuit of science would infer from this that nothing actually perishes completely exactly returned rimenez emphatically there my dear tempest is the mischief or the deity of things nothing can be entirely annihilated not even a thought i was silent watching him while he put the glass case with its uncanny occupant away out of sight and now for luncheon he said gaily passing his arm through mine you look twenty per cent better than when you went out this morning geoffrey so i conclude your legal matters are disposed of satisfactorily and what else have you done with yourself seated at table with the dark-faced emile in attendance i related my morning's adventures dwelling at length on my chance meeting with the publisher who had on the previous day refused my manuscript and who now i felt sure would be only too glad to close with the offer i had made him rimenez listened attentively smiling now and then of course he said when i had concluded there is nothing in the least surprising in the conduct of the worthy man in fact i think he showed remarkable discretion and decency in not at once jumping at your proposition his pleasant hypocrisy in retiring to think it over shows him to be a person of tact and foresight did you ever imagine that a human being or a human conscience existed that could not be bought my good fellow you can buy a king if you only give a long price enough and the pope will sell you a specially reserved seat in his heaven if you will only hand him the cash down while he is on earth nothing is given free in this world save the air and the sunshine everything else must be bought with blood tears and groans occasionally but oftenest with money i fancied that emile behind his master's chair smiled darkly at this and my instinctive dislike of the fellow kept me more or less reticent concerning my affairs till the luncheon was over i could not formulate to myself any substantial reason for my aversion to this confidential servant of the prince's but do what i would the aversion remained and increased each time i saw his sullen and as i thought sneering features yet he was perfectly respectful and deferential i could find no actual fault with him nevertheless when at last he placed the coffee cognac and cigars on the table and noiselessly withdrew i was conscious of a great relief and breathed more freely as soon as we were alone rimenez lit a cigar and settled himself for a smoke looking over at me with a personal interest and kindness which made his handsome face more than ever attractive now let us talk he said i believe i am at present the best friend you have and i certainly know the world better than you do what do you propose to make of your life or in other words how do you mean to begin spending your money i laughed well i shan't provide funds for the building of a church or the endowment of a hospital i said i shall not even start a free library for these institutions besides becoming centers for infectious diseases generally get presided over by a committee of local grocers who presume to consider themselves judges of literature my dear prince rimenez i mean to spend my money on my own pleasure and i dare say i shall find plenty of ways to do it rimenez fanned away the smoke of his cigar with one hand 
and his dark eyes shone with a peculiarly vivid light through the pale grey floating haze with your fortune you could make hundreds of miserable people happy he suggested thanks i would rather be happy myself first i answered gaily i dare say i seem to you selfish you are philanthropic i know i am not he still regarded me steadily you might help your fellow workers in literature i interrupted him with a decided gesture that i will never do my friend though the heavens should crack my fellow workers in literature have kicked me down at every opportunity and done their best to keep me from earning a bare livelihood it is my turn at kicking now and i will show them as little mercy as little help as little sympathy as they have shown me revenge is sweet he quoted sententiously i should recommend your starting a high-class half-crown magazine why can you ask just think of the ferocious satisfaction it would give you to receive the manuscripts of your literary enemies and reject them to throw their letters into the waste-paper basket and send back their poems stories political articles and what not with returned with thanks or not up to our mark typewritten on the backs thereof to dig knives into your rivals through the medium of anonymous criticism the howling joy of a savage with twenty scalps at his belt would be tame in comparison to it i was an editor once myself and i know i laughed at his whimsical earnestness i dare say you are right i said i can grasp the vengeful position thoroughly but the management of a magazine would be too much trouble to me too much of a tie don't manage it follow the example of all the big editors and live out of the business altogether but take the profits you never see the real editor of a leading daily newspaper you know you can only interview the sub the real man according to the seasons of the year at ascot in scotland at newmarket or wintering in egypt he is supposed to be responsible for everything in his journal, but he is generally the last person who knows anything about it. He relies on his staff, a very bad crutch at times, and when his staff are in a difficulty, they get out of it by saying they are unable to decide without the editor. Meanwhile, the editor is miles away, comfortably free from worry. You could bamboozle the public in that way, if you liked. I could, but I shouldn't care to do so, I answered. If I had a business, I would not neglect it. I believe in doing things thoroughly. So do I, responded Rimenez promptly. I am a very thorough-going fellow myself, and whatever my hand findeth to do, I do it with my might. Excuse me for quoting scripture. He smiled, a little ironically, I thought, then resumed. Well, in what at present does your idea of enjoying your heritage consist in publishing my book i answered that very book i could get no one to accept i tell you i will make it the talk of london possibly you will he said looking at me through half-closed eyes and a cloud of smoke london easily talks particularly on unsavoury and questionable subjects therefore as i have already hinted if your book were a judicious mixture of zola hoysmans and baudelaire or had for its heroine a modest maid who considered honourable marriage a degradation it would be quite sure of success in these days of new sodom and gomorrah here he suddenly sprang up and flinging away his cigar confronted me why do not the heavens rain fire on this accursed city it is ripe for punishment full of abhorrent creatures not worth the torturing in hell to which it is said liars and hypocrites are condemned tempest if there is one human being more than another that i utterly abhor it is the type of man so common to the present time the man who huddles his own loathly vices under a cloak of assumed broad-mindedness and virtue such a one will even deify the loss of chastity in woman by the name of purity because he knows that it is by her moral and physical ruin alone that he can gratify his brutal lusts rather than be such a sanctimonious coward i would openly proclaim myself vile and that is because yours is a noble nature i said you are an exception to the rule an exception i and he laughed bitterly yes you are right 
I am an exception among men, perhaps, but I am one with the beasts in honesty. The lion does not assume the manners of the dove. He loudly announces his own ferocity. The very cobra, stealthy though its movements be, evinces its meaning by a warning hiss or rattle. The hungry wolf's bay is heard far down the wind, intimidating the hurrying traveller among the wastes of snow. But man gives no clue to his intent. More malignant than the lion, more treacherous than the snake, more greedy than the wolf, he takes his fellow man's hand in pretended friendship, and an hour later defames his character behind his back. With a smiling face he hides a false and selfish heart. Flinging his pygmy mockery at the riddle of the universe, he stands jibing at God, feebly astraddle on his own earth grave. Heavens! Here he stops short with a passionate gesture. What should the eternities do with such a thankless blind worm as he? His voice rang out with singular emphasis. His eyes glowed with a fiery ardor. Startled by his impressive manner, I let my cigar die out and stared at him in mute amazement. What an inspired countenance! What an imposing figure! How sovereignly supreme and almost godlike in his looks he seemed at the moment! And yet there was something terrifying in his attitude of protest and defiance. He caught my wondering glance. The glow of passion faded from his face. He laughed and shrugged his shoulders. I think I was born to be an actor, he said carelessly. Now and then the love of declamation masters me. Then I speak as prime ministers and men in parliament speak to suit the humour of the hour and without meaning a single word i say i cannot accept that statement i answered him smiling a little you do mean what you say though i fancy you are rather a creature of impulse do you really he exclaimed how wise of you good geoffrey tempest how very wise of you but you are wrong there was never a being created who was less impulsive or more charged with set purpose than I. Believe me or not as you like. Belief is a sentiment that cannot be forced. If I told you that I am a dangerous companion, that I like evil things better than good, that I am not a safe guide for any man, what would you think? I should think you were whimsically fond of underestimating your own qualities, I said, relighting my cigar, and feeling somewhat amused by his earnestness and I should like you just as well as I do now, perhaps better, though that would be difficult. At these words he seated himself, bending his steadfast dark eyes full upon me. Tempest, you follow the fashion of the prettiest woman about town. They always like the greatest scoundrels. But you are not a scoundrel, I rejoined, smoking peacefully. No, I'm not a scoundrel, but there's a good deal of the devil in me. All the better, I said, stretching myself out in my chair with lazy comfort. I hope there's something of him in me, too. Do you believe in him? asked Rimenez, smiling. The devil? Of course not. He is a very fascinating legendary personage, continued the prince, lighting another cigar and beginning to puff at it slowly. And he is the subject of many a fine story. Picture his fall from heaven. Lucifer, son of the morning, what a title, and what a birthright! To be born of the morning implies to be a creature formed of translucent light undefiled, with all the warm rose of a million orbs of day colouring his bright essence, and all the lustre of fiery planets flaming in his eyes. Splendid and supreme, at the right hand of deity itself he stood, this majestic archangel and before his unwearied vision rolled the grandest creative splendors of God's thoughts and dreams. All at once he perceived in the vista of embryonic things a new, small world, and on it a being forming itself slowly, as it were, into the angelic likeness, a being weak yet strong, sublime yet foolish, a strange paradox destined to work its way through all the phases of life, till imbibing the very breath and soul of the Creator, it should touch conscious immortality, eternal joy. Then Lucifer, full of wrath, turned on the master of the spheres, and flung forth his reckless defiance, crying aloud, Wilt thou make of this slight poor creature an angel even as I, 
I do protest against thee and condemn. Lo, if thou makest man in our image, I will destroy him utterly, as unfit to share with me the splendors of thy wisdom, the glory of thy love. And the voice supreme, in accents terrible and beautiful, replied, Lucifer, son of the morning, full well dost thou know that never can an idle or wasted word be spoken before me. For free will is the gift of the immortals. Therefore, what thou sayest, thou must needs do. Fall, proud spirit, from thy high estate, thou and thy companions with thee, and return no more till man himself redeem thee. Each human soul that yields unto thy tempting shall be a new barrier set between thee and heaven. Each one that of its own choice doth repel and overcome thee shall lift thee nearer thy lost home. When the world rejects thee, I will pardon and again receive thee, but not till then. I never heard exactly that version of the legend before, I said. The idea that man should redeem the devil is quite new to me. Is it? And he looked at me fixedly. Well, it is one form of the story, and by no means the most unpoetical. Poor Lucifer! His punishment is of course eternal, and the distance between himself and heaven must be rapidly increasing every day. For man will never assist him to retrieve his error. Man will reject God fast enough and gladly enough, but never the devil. Judge, then, how, under the peculiar circumstances of his doom, this Lucifer, son of the morning, Satan, or whatever else he is called, must hate humanity. I smiled. Well, he has one remedy left to him, I observed. He need not tempt anybody. You forget he is bound to keep his word according to the legend, said Rimenez. He swore before God that he would destroy man utterly. He must therefore fulfill that oath, if he can. Angels, it would seem, may not swear before the Eternal without endeavoring at least to fulfill their vows. Men swear in the name of God every day, without the slightest intention of carrying out their promises. But it's all the veriest nonsense, I said, somewhat impatiently. All these old legends are rubbish. You tell the story well, and almost as if you believed in it. That is because you have the gift of speaking with eloquence. Nowadays no one believes in either devils or angels. I, for example, do not even believe in the soul. I know you do not, he answered suavely. And your skepticism is very comfortable, because it relieves you of all personal responsibility. I envy you, for, I regret to say, I am compelled to believe in the soul. Compelled? I echoed. That is absurd. No one can compel you to accept a mere theory. He looked at me with a flitting smile that darkened rather than lightened his face. True, very true. There is no compelling force in the whole universe. Man is the supreme and independent creature, master of all he surveys, and owning no other dominion save his personal desire. True, I forgot. Let us avoid theology, please and psychology also. Let us talk about the only subject that has any sense or interest in it, namely, money. I perceive your present plans are definite. You wish to publish a book that shall create a stir and make you famous. It seems a modest enough campaign. Have you no wider ambitions? There are several ways, you know, of getting talked about. Shall I enumerate them for your consideration? I laughed if you like. Well, in the first place, I should suggest your getting yourself properly paragraphed. It must be known to the press that you are an exceedingly rich man. There is an agency for the circulation of paragraphs. I dare say they'll do it sufficiently well, for about ten or twenty guineas. I open my eyes a little at this. Oh, is that the way these things are done? My dear fellow, how else should they be done? he demanded somewhat impatiently. Do you think anything in the world is done without money? Are the poor, hard-working journalists your brothers or your bosom friends that they should lift you into the public notice without getting something for their trouble? If you do not manage them properly in this way, they'll abuse you quite heartily and free of cost. That I can promise you. I know a literary agent, a very worthy man, too, who, 
for a hundred guineas down, will so ply the paragraph wheel that in a few weeks it shall seem to the outside public that Geoffrey Tempest, the millionaire, is the only person worth talking about, and the one desirable creature whom to shake hands with is next in honour to meeting royalty itself. Secure him, I said indolently, and pay him two hundred guineas. So shall all the world hear of me. When you have been paragraphed thoroughly, went on Rimenez, the next move will be a dash into what is called swagger society. This must be done cautiously and by degrees. You must be presented at the first levy of the season, and later on I will get you an invitation to some great lady's house, where you will meet the Prince of Wales privately at dinner. If you can oblige or please His Royal Highness in any way, so much the better for you. He is at least the most popular royalty in Europe, so it should not be difficult to you to make yourself agreeable. Following upon this event, you must purchase a fine country seat, and have that fact paragraphed. Then you can rest and look round. Society will have taken you up, and you will find yourself in the swim. I laughed heartily, well entertained by his fluent discourse. I should not, he resumed, propose your putting yourself to the trouble of getting into Parliament. That is no longer necessary to the career of a gentleman. But I should strongly recommend your winning the derby. I dare say you would, I answered mirthfully. It's an admirable suggestion, but not very easy to follow. If you wish to win the derby, he rejoined quietly, you shall win it. I'll guarantee both horse and jockey. Something in his decisive tone impressed me, and I leaned forward to study his features more closely. Are you a worker of miracles? I asked him, jestingly. Do you mean it? Try me, he responded. Shall I enter a horse for you? You can't. It's too late, I said. You would need to be the devil himself to do it. Besides, I don't care about racing. You will have to amend your taste, then, he replied. That is, if you want to make yourself agreeable to the English aristocracy, for they are interested in little else. No really great lady is without her betting book, though she may be deficient in her knowledge of spelling. You may make the biggest literary furor of the season, and that will count as nothing among swagger people. But, if you win the derby, you will be a really famous man. Personally speaking, I have a great deal to do with racing. In fact, I am devoted to it. I am always present at every great race. I never miss one. I always bet, and I never lose. And now, let me proceed with your social plan of action. After winning the derby, you will enter for a yacht race at Coe's, and allow the Prince of Wales to beat you just narrowly. Then you will give a grand dinner, arranged by a perfect chef, and you will entertain His Royal Highness to the strains of Britannia Rules the Waves, which will serve as a pretty compliment. You will allude to the same well-worn song in a graceful speech, and the probable result of all this will be one, or perhaps two, royal invitations. So far, so good. With the heats of summer, you will go to Hamburg to drink the waters there, whether you require them or not, and in the autumn you will assemble a shooting party at the country seat before mentioned, which you will have purchased, and invite royalty to join you in killing the poor little partridges. Then your name in society may be considered as made, and you can marry whatever fair lady happens to be in the market. Thanks, much obliged and I gave way to hearty laughter. Upon my word, Lucio, your program is perfect. It lacks nothing. It is the orthodox round of social success, said Lucio, with admirable gravity. Intellect and originality have nothing whatever to do with it. Only money is needed to perform it all. You forget my book, I interposed. I know there is some intellect in that, and some originality, too. Surely that will give me an extra lift up the heights of fashionable light and leading. I doubt it, he answered. I very much doubt it. It will be received with a certain amount of favor, of course, as a production of a rich man amusing himself with literature as a sort of whim. 
but, as I told you before, genius seldom develops itself under the influence of wealth. Then again, swagger folks can never get it out of their fuddled heads that literature belongs to Grub Street. Great poets, great philosophers, great romanticists are always vaguely alluded to by swagger society as those sort of people. Those sort of people are so interesting, say the blue-blooded noodles deprecatingly, excusing themselves, as it were, for knowing any members of the class literary. You can fancy a swagger lady of Elizabeth's time asking a friend, Oh, do you mind, dear, if I bring one Master William Shakespeare to see you? He writes plays, and does something or other at the Globe Theatre. In fact, I'm afraid he acts a little. He's not very well off, poor man. But these sort of people are always so amusing. Now you, my dear Tempest, are not a Shakespeare. But your millions will give you a better chance than he ever had in his lifetime. As you will not have to sue for patronage, or practice a reverence for my lord or my lady. These exalted personages will be only too delighted to borrow money of you if you will lend it. I shall not lend, I said. Nor give, nor give. His keen eyes flashed approval. I am very glad, he observed, that you are determined not to go about doing good, as the canting humbugs say, with your money. You are wise. Spend on yourself, because you are very active spending cannot but benefit others through various channels. Now, I pursue a different course. I always help charities, and put my name on subscription lists, and I never fail to assist a certain portion of clergy. I rather wonder at that, I remarked, especially as you tell me you are not a Christian. Yes, it does seem strange, doesn't it? He said, with an extraordinary accent of what might be termed apologetic derision but perhaps you don't look at it in the proper light. Many of the clergy are doing their utmost best to destroy religion, by cant, by hypocrisy, by sensuality, by shams of every description, and when they seek my help in this noble work, I give it freely. I laughed. You must have your joke, evidently, I said, throwing the end of my finished cigar into the fire, and I see you are fond of satirizing your own good actions. Hello, what's this? For at that moment Emil entered, bearing a telegram for me on a silver salver. I opened it. It was from my friend the publisher, and ran as follows. Accept book with pleasure. Send manuscript immediately. I showed this to Rimenez with a kind of triumph. He smiled. Of course. What else did you expect? Only the man should have worded his telegram differently. For I do not suppose he would accept the book with pleasure if he had to lay out his own cash upon it. Except money for publishing book with pleasure should have been the true message of the wire. Well, what are you going to do? I shall see about this at once, I answered, feeling a thrill of satisfaction that at last the time of vengeance on certain of my enemies was approaching. The book must be hurried through the press as quickly as possible and I shall take a particular pleasure in personally attending to all the details concerning it. For the rest of my plans? Leave them to me, said Rimenez, laying his finely shaped white hand with a masterful pressure on my shoulder. Leave them to me, and be sure that before very long I shall have sent you aloft like the bear who has successfully reached the bun on the top of a greased pole, a spectacle for the envy of men, and the wonder of angels. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of The Sorrows of Satan by Marie Corelli This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The next three or four weeks flew by in a whirl of excitement, and by the time they were ended, I found it hard to recognize myself in the indolent, listless, extravagant man of fashion I had so suddenly become. Sometimes, at stray and solitary moments, the past turned back upon me like a revolving picture in a glass, with a flash of unwelcome recollection, and I saw myself, worn and hungry and shabbily clothed, bending over my writing in my dreary lodging, wretched, 
yet amid all my wretchedness receiving curious comfort from my own thoughts, which created beauty out of penury and love out of loneliness. This creative faculty was now dormant in me. I did very little, and thought less. But I felt certain that this intellectual apathy was but a passing phase, a mental holiday and desirable cessation from brain work, to which I was deservedly entitled, after all my sufferings at the hands of poverty and disappointment. My book was nearly through the press, and perhaps the chiefest pleasure of any I now enjoyed was the correction of the proofs as they passed under my supervision. Yet even this, the satisfaction of authorship, had its drawback, and my particular grievance was somewhat singular. I read my own work with gratification, of course, for I was not behind my contemporaries in thinking well of myself, in all I did. But my complacent literary egoism was mixed with a good deal of disagreeable astonishment and incredulity, because my work, written with enthusiasm and feeling, propounded sentiments and inculcated theories which I personally did not believe in. Now, how had this happened? I asked myself. Why had I thus invited the public to accept me at a false valuation? I paused to consider, and I found the suggestion puzzling. How came I to write the book at all, seeing that it was utterly unlike me as I now knew myself? My pen, consciously or unconsciously, had written down things which my reasoning faculties entirely repudiated, such as belief in a god, trust in the eternal possibilities of man's diviner progress. I credited neither of these doctrines. When I imagined such transcendental and foolish dreams, I was poor, starving, and without a friend in the world. Remembering all this, I promptly set down my so-called inspiration to the action of an ill-nourished brain. Yet there was something subtle in the teaching of the story, and one afternoon, when I was revising some of the last proof-sheets, I caught myself thinking that the book was nobler than its writer. And this idea smote me with a sudden pang. I pushed my papers aside, and walking to the window, looked out. It was raining hard and the streets were black with mud and slush. The foot-passengers were drenched and miserable. The whole prospect was dreary, and the fact that I was a rich man did not in the least lift from my mind the depression that had stolen on me unawares. I was quite alone, for I had my own suite of rooms now in the hotel, not far from those occupied by Prince Rimenez. I also had my own servant, a respectable, good sort of fellow, whom I rather liked, because he shared to the full the instinctive aversion I felt for the prince's man, Emile. Then I had my own carriage and horses with attendant coachman and groom, so that the prince and I, though the most intimate friends in the world, were able to avoid that familiarity which breeds contempt by keeping up our own separate establishments. On this particular afternoon, I was in a more miserable humor than ever my poverty had brought upon me. Yet, from a strictly reasonable point of view, I had nothing to be miserable about. I was in full possession of my fortune. I enjoyed excellent health, and I had everything I wanted, with the added consciousness that if my wants increased, I could gratify them easily. The paragraph wheel, under Lucio's management, had been worked with such good effect that I had seen myself mentioned in almost every paper in London and the provinces as the famous millionaire, and for the benefit of the public, who are sadly uninstructed on these matters, I may here state as a very plain unvarnished truth that for forty pounds a well-known agency will guarantee the insertion of any paragraph, provided it is not libelous, in no less than four hundred newspapers. The art of booming is thus easily explained, and level-headed people will be able to comprehend why it is that a few names of authors are constantly mentioned in the press, while others, perhaps more deserving, remain ignored. Merit counts as nothing in such circumstances. Money wins the day. And the persistent paragraphing of my name, together with a description of my personal appearance, and my marvelous literary gifts, combined with a deferential and almost awe-struck allusion to the millions which made me so interesting, 
The paragraph was written out by Lucio, and handed for circulation to the agency aforesaid with money down. All this, I say, brought upon me two inflictions. First, any amount of invitations to social and artistic functions, and secondly, a continuous stream of begging letters. I was compelled to employ a secretary, who occupied a room near my suite, and who was kept hard at work all day. Needless to say, I refused all appeals for money. No one had helped me in my distress, with the exception of my old chum Baffles. No one save he had given me even so much as a word of sympathy. I was resolved now to be as hard and as merciless as I had found my contemporaries. I had a certain grim pleasure in reading letters from two or three literary men asking for work as secretary or companion, or failing that for the loan of a little cash to tide over present difficulties. One of these applicants was a journalist on the staff of a well-known paper who had promised to find me work, and who instead of doing so, had, as I afterwards learned, strongly dissuaded his editor from giving me any employment. He never imagined that Tempest the millionaire and Tempest the literary hack were one and the same person. So little do the majority think that wealth can ever fall to the lot of authors. I wrote to him myself, however, and told him what I deemed it well he should know, adding my sarcastic thanks for his friendly assistance to me in time of need, and herein I tasted something of the sharp delight of vengeance. I never heard from him again, and I am pretty sure my letter gave him material not only for astonishment but meditation. Yet with all the advantages over both friends and enemies which I now possessed, I could not honestly say I was happy. I knew I could have every possible enjoyment and amusement the world had to offer. I knew I was one of the most envied among men, and yet, as I stood looking out of the window at the persistently falling rain, I was conscious of a bitterness rather than a sweetness in the full cup of fortune. Many things that I had imagined would give me intense satisfaction had fallen curiously flat. For example, I had flooded the press with the most carefully worded and prominent advertisements of my forthcoming book, and when I was poor I had pictured to myself how I should revel in doing this. Now that it was done, I cared nothing at all about it. I was simply weary of the sight of my own advertised name. I certainly did look forward, with very genuine feeling and expectation, to the publication of my work when that should be an accomplished fact. But today, even that idea had lost some of its attractiveness, owing to this new and unpleasant impression on my mind, that the contents of that book were as utterly the reverse of my own true thoughts as they could well be. A fog began to darken down over the streets in company with the rain, and disgusted with the weather and with myself, I turned away from the window and settled into an armchair by the fire, poking the coal till it blazed and wondering what I should do to rid my mind of the gloom that threatened to envelop it in as thick a canopy as that of the London fog. A tap came at the door, and an answer to my somewhat irritable, Come in! Rimenez entered. What, all in the dark, Tempest? he exclaimed cheerfully. Why don't you light up? The fire's enough, I answered crossly. Enough at any rate to think by. And have you been thinking? he inquired, laughing. Don't do it. It's a bad habit. No one thinks nowadays. People can't stand it. Their heads are too frail. Once begin to think, and down go the foundations of society. Besides, thinking is always dull work. I have found it so, I said gloomily. Lucio, there is something wrong about me somewhere. His eyes flashed keen, half-amused inquiry into mine. Wrong? Oh, no, surely not. What can there be wrong about you, Tempest? Are you not one of the richest men living? I let the satire pass. Listen, my friend, I said earnestly. You know I have been busy for the last fortnight correcting the proofs of my book for the press, do you not? He nodded with a smiling air. Well, I have arrived almost at the end of my work, and I have come to the conclusion that the book is not me. It is not a reflex of my feelings at all, and I cannot understand how I came to write it. You find it stupid, perhaps? said Lucio, sympathetically. No, I answered with a touch of indignation. I do not find it stupid. Dull, then? No, it is not dull. Melodramatic? No, not melodramatic. Well, my good fellow, 
if it is not dull or stupid or melodramatic what is it he exclaimed merrily it must be something yes it is this it is beyond me altogether and i spoke with some bitterness quite beyond me i could not write it now i wonder i could write it then lucio i dare say i am talking foolishly but it seems to me i must have been on some higher altitude of thought when i wrote the book a height from which i have since fallen i'm sorry to hear this he answered with twinkling eyes from what you say it appears to me you have been guilty of literary sublimity oh bad very bad nothing can be worse to write sublimely is a grievous sin and one which critics never forgive i'm really grieved for you my friend i never thought your case was quite so desperate i laughed in spite of my depression you are incorrigible lucio i said but your cheerfulness is very inspiriting all i want to do explain to you is this that my book expresses a certain tone of thought which purporting to be mine is not me in short i in my present self have no sympathy with it i must have changed very much since i wrote it changed why yes i should think so and lucio laughed heartily the possession of five millions is bound to change a man considerably for the better or worse but you seem to be worrying yourself most absurdly about nothing not one author in many centuries writes from his own heart or as he truly feels when he does he becomes well-nigh immortal this planet is too limited to hold more than one homer one plato one shakespeare don't distress yourself you are neither of these three you belong to the age tempest it is a decadent ephemeral age and most things connected with it are decadent and ephemeral any era that is dominated by the love of money only has a rotten core within it and must perish all history tells us so but no one accepts the lesson of history observe the signs of the time art is made subservient to the love of money literature politics and religion the same you cannot escape from the general disease the only thing to do is to make the best of it no one can reform it least of all you who have so much of the lucre given to your share he paused i was silent watching the bright fire glow and the dropping red cinders what i am going to say now he proceeded in soft almost melancholy accents will sound ridiculously trite still it has the perverse prosiness of truth about it it is this in order to write with intense feeling you must first feel very likely when you wrote this book of yours you were almost a human hedgehog in the way of feeling every prickly point of you was erect and responsive to the touch of all influences pleasant or the reverse imaginative or realistic this is a condition which some people envy and others would rather dispense with now that you as a hedgehog have no further need for either alarm indignation or self-defense your prickles are soothed into an agreeable passiveness and you partially cease to feel that is all the change you complain of is thus accounted for you have nothing to feel about hence you cannot comprehend how it was that you ever felt i was conscious of irritation at the calm conviction of his tone do you take me for such a callous creature as all that i exclaimed you are mistaken in me lucio i feel most keenly what do you feel he inquired fixing his eyes steadily upon me there are hundreds of starving wretches in this metropolis men and women on the brink of suicide because they have no hope of anything in this world or the next and no sympathy from their kind do you feel for them do their griefs affect you you know they do not you know you never think of them why should you one of the chief advantages of wealth is the ability it gives us to shut out other people's miseries from our personal consideration i said nothing for the first time my spirit chafed at the truth of his words principally because they were true <laughs> alas lucio if i had only known then what i know now yesterday he went on in the same quiet voice a child was run over here just opposite this hotel it was only a poor child mark that only its mother ran shrieking out of some back street hard by in time to see the little bleeding body carted up in a mangled heap 
She struck wildly with both hands at the men who were trying to lead her away, and with a cry like that of some hurt savage animal fell face forward in the mud, dead. She was only a poor woman, another only. There were three lines in the paper about it headed, Sad Incident. The hotel porter here witnessed the scene from the door with as composed a demeanor as that of a fop at the play, never relaxing the serene majesty of his attitude. But about ten minutes after the dead body of the woman had been carried out of sight, he, the imperial, gold-buttoned being, became almost crook-backed in his servile haste to run and open the door of your brougham, my dear Geoffrey, as you drove up to the entrance. This is a little epitome of life as it is lived nowadays, and yet the canting clerics swear we are all equal in the sight of heaven. We may be, though it does not look much like it, and if we are, it does not matter, as we have ceased to care how heaven regards us. I don't want to point a moral. I simply tell you that the sad incident as it occurred, and I am sure you are not the least sorry for the fate of either the child who was run over or its mother who died in the sharp agony of a sudden broken heart. Now, don't say you are, because I know you're not. How can one feel sorry for people one does not know, or has never seen, I began. Exactly. How was it possible? And there we have it. How can one feel, when one's self is so thoroughly comfortable as to be without any other feeling save that of material ease? Thus, my dear Geoffrey, you must be content to let your book appear as the reflex and record of your past when you were in the prickly or sensitive state. Now you are encased in a pachydermatous covering of gold, which adequately protects you from such influences as might have made you start and writhe, perhaps even roar with indignation, and in the access of fierce torture, stretch out your hands and grasp, quite unconsciously, the winged thing called fame. You should have been an orator, I said, rising and pacing the room to and fro in vexation. But to me, your words are not consoling, and I do not think they are true. Fame is easily enough secured. Pardon me if I am obstinate, said Lucio, with a deprecatory gesture. Notoriety is easily secured, very easily. A few critics, who have dined with you and had their fill of wine, will give you notoriety but fame is the voice of the whole civilized public of the world. The public, I echoed contemptuously, the public only care for trash. It is a pity you should appeal to it then, he responded with a smile. If you think so little of the public, why give it anything of your brain? It is not worthy of so rare a boon. Come, come, Tempest, do not join in the snarl of unsuccessful authors who take refuge, when marked unsaleable, in pouring out abuse on the public. The public is the author's best friend and truest critic. But if you prefer to despise it in company with all the very little literature mongers who form a mutual admiration society, I tell you what to do. Print just twenty copies of your book, and present these to the leading reviewers, and when they have written you up, as they will do, I'll take care of that. Let your publisher advertise to the effect that the first and second large editions of the new novel by Geoffrey Tempest are exhausted, 100,000 copies having been sold in a week. If that does not waken up the world in general, I shall be much surprised. I laughed. I was gradually getting into a better humor. It would be quite as fair a plan of action as is adopted by many modern publishers, I said. The loud hawking of literary wares nowadays reminds me of the rival shouting of costermongers in a low neighborhood. But I will not go quite so far. I'll win my fame legitimately if I can. You can't, declared Lucio, with a serene smile. It's impossible. You are too rich. That of itself is not legitimate in literature, which great art generally elects to wear poverty in its buttonhole as a flower of grace. The fight cannot be equal in such circumstances. The fact that you are a millionaire must weigh the balance apparently in your favor for a time. The world cannot resist money. If I, for example, became an author, I should probably, with my wealth and influence, burn up everyone else's laurels. Suppose that a desperately poor man comes out with a book at the same time as you do. 
he will have scarcely the ghost of a chance against you. He will not be able to advertise in your lavish style, nor will he see his way to dine the critics as you can. And if he should happen to have more genius than you, and you succeed, your success will not be legitimate. But after all, that does not matter much. In art, if in nothing else, things always right themselves. I made no immediate reply, but went over to my table, rolled up my corrected proofs, and directed them to the printers. Then, ringing the bell, I gave the packet to my man, Morris, bidding him post it at once. This done, I turned again towards Lucio, and saw that he still sat by the fire, but that his attitude was now one of brooding melancholy, and that he had covered his eyes with one hand, on which the glow from the flames shone red. I regretted the momentary irritation I had felt against him for telling me unwelcome truths, and I touched him lightly on the shoulder. "'Are you in the dumps now, Lucio?' I said. "'I'm afraid my depression has proved infectious.' He moved his hand and looked up. His eyes were large and lustrous as the eyes of a beautiful woman. "'I was thinking,' he said with a slight sigh, "'of the last words I uttered just now. "'Things always write themselves.' Curiously enough, in art, they always do. No charlatanism or sham lasts with the gods of Parnassus, but in other matters it is different. For instance, I shall never write myself. Life is hateful to me at times, as it is to everybody. Perhaps you are in love, I said with a smile. He started up. In love? By all the heavens and all the earths, too. That suggestion wakes me with a vengeance. In love? What woman alive do you think could impress me with the notion that she was anything more than a frivolous doll of pink and white, with long hair, frequently not her own? And as for the tomboy tennis players and giantesses of the era, I do not consider them women at all. They are merely the unnatural and strutting embryos of a new sex, which will be neither male nor female. My dear Tempest, I hate women. So would you, if you knew as much about them as I do. They have made me what I am, and they keep me so. They are much to be complimented, then, I observed. You do them credit. I do, he answered slowly, in more ways than one. A faint smile was on his face, and his eyes brightened with that curious jewel-like gleam I had noticed several times before. Believe me, I shall never contest with you in such a slight gift as woman's love, Geoffrey. It is not worth fighting for. And... Apropos of women, that reminds me. I have promised to take you to the Earl of Elton's box at the Haymarket tonight. He is a poor peer, very gouty and somewhat heavily flavored with port wine. But his daughter, Lady Sibyl, is one of the belles of England. She was presented last season and created quite a furor. Will you come? I am quite at your disposition, I said, glad of any excuse to escape the dullness of my own company and to be in that of Lucio, whose talk, even if its satire galled me occasionally, always fascinated my mind and remained in my memory. What time shall we meet? Go and dress now, and join me at dinner, he answered, and we'll drive together to the theatre afterwards. The play is on the usual theme which has lately become popular with stage managers. The glorification of a fallen lady and the exhibition of her as an example of something superlatively pure and good, to the astonished eyes of the innocent. As a play, it is not worth seeing, but perhaps Lady Sibyl is. He smiled again as he stood facing me. The light flames of the fire had died down to a dull, uniform, coppery red. We were almost in darkness, and I pressed the small button near the mantelpiece that flooded the room with electric light. His extraordinary beauty then struck me afresh, as something altogether singular and half unearthly. "'Don't you find that people look at you very often as you pass, Lucio?' I asked him suddenly and impulsively. He laughed. "'Not at all. Why should they? Every man is so intent on his own aims, and thinks so much of his own personality, that he would scarcely forget his ego if the very devil himself were behind him.' Women look at me sometimes, with the affected, coy, and kitten-like interest usually exhibited by the frail sex for a personable man. I cannot blame them, I answered, my gaze still resting on his stately figure and fine head, 
with as much admiration as I might have felt for a noble picture or statue. What of this Lady Sibyl we are to meet tonight? How does she regard you? Lady Sibyl has never seen me, he replied, and I have only seen her at a distance. It is chiefly for the purpose of an introduction to her that the Earl has asked us to his box this evening. Ha ha! Matrimony in view! I exclaimed, jestingly. Yes, I believe Lady Sibyl is for sale, he answered with the callous coldness that occasionally distinguished him and made his handsome features look like an impenetrable mask of scorn. But up to the present the bids have not been sufficiently high, and I shall not purchase. I have told you already, Tempest, I hate women. Seriously? Most seriously. Women have always done me harm. They have wantonly hindered me in my progress. And why I specially abominate them is that they have been gifted with an enormous power for doing good, and that they let this power run to waste and will not use it. Their deliberate enjoyment and choice of the repulsive, vulgar, and commonplace side of life disgusts me. They are much less sensitive than men, and infinitely more heartless. They are the mothers of the human race, and the faults of the race are chiefly due to them. That is another reason for my hatred. Do you want the human race to be perfect? I asked, astonished. Because if you do, you will find that impossible. He stood for a moment, apparently lost in thought. Everything in the universe is perfect, he said, except that curious piece of work, man. Have you never thought out any reason why he should be the one flaw, the one incomplete creature in a matchless creation? No, I have not, I replied. I take things as I find them. So do I, and he turned away. And as I find them, so they find me. Au revoir. Dinner in an hour's time, remember. The door opened and closed. He was gone. I remained alone for a little, thinking what a strange disposition was his. What a curious mixture of philosophy, worldliness, sentiment, and satire seemed to run like the veins of a leaf through the variable temperament of this brilliant, semi-mysterious personage, who had, by mere chance, become my greatest friend. We had now been more or less together for nearly a month, and I was no closer to the secret of his actual nature than I had been at first, yet I admired him more than ever. Without his society, I felt life would be deprived of half its charm, for though, attracted as human moths will be by the glare of my glittering millions, numbers of so-called friends now surrounded me, there was not one among them who so dominated my every mood and with whom I had so much close sympathy as this man, this masterful, half-cruel, half-kind companion of my days, who at times seemed to accept all life as the veriest bagatelle, and myself as a part of the trivial game. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of the Sorrows of Satan by Marie Corelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. No man, I think, ever forgets the first time he is brought face to face with perfect beauty in woman. He may have caught fleeting glimpses of loveliness on many fair faces often. Bright eyes may have flashed on him like starbeams. The hues of a dazzling complexion may now and then have charmed him, or the seductive outlines of a graceful figure. All these are as mere peeps into the infinite. But when such vague and passing impressions are suddenly drawn together in one focus, when all his dreamy fancies of form and color take visible and complete manifestation in one living creature who looks down upon him, as it were, from an empyrean of untouched maiden pride and purity. It is more to his honor than his shame, if his senses swoon at the ravishing vision, and he, despite his rough masculinity and brute strength, becomes nothing but the merest slave to passion. In this way was I overwhelmed and conquered without any chance of deliverance when Sybil Elton's violet eyes, lifted slowly from the shadow of their dark lashes, rested upon me with that indefinable expression of mingled interest and indifference which is supposed to indicate high breeding, but which more frequently 
intimidates and repulses the frank and sensitive soul the lady sibyl's glance repelled but i was none the less attracted Rimenez and i had entered the earl of elton's box at the haymarket between the first and second acts of the play and the earl himself an unimpressive bald-headed red-faced old gentleman with fuzzy white whiskers had risen to welcome us seizing the prince's hand and shaking it with particular effusiveness i learned afterwards that lucio had lent him a thousand pounds on easy terms a fact which partly accounted for the friendly fervour of his greeting his daughter had not moved but a minute or two later when he addressed her somewhat sharply saying sibyl prince rimenez and his friend mr geoffrey tempest she turned her head and honoured us both with the chill glance i have endeavoured to describe and the very faintest possible bow as an acknowledgment of our presence her exquisite beauty smote me dumb and foolish i could find nothing to say and stood silent and confused with a strange sensation of bewilderment upon me the old earl made some remark about the play which i scarcely heard though i answered vaguely and at haphazard the orchestra was playing abominably as is usual in theatres and its brazen din sounded like the noise of the sea in my ears i had not much real consciousness of anything save the wondrous loveliness of the girl who faced me clad in pure white with a few diamonds shining about her like stray dewdrops on a rose lucio spoke to her and i listened at last lady sibyl he said bending towards her deferentially at last i have the honour of meeting you i have seen you often as one sees a star at a distance she smiled a smile so slight and cold that it scarcely lifted the corners of her lovely lips i do not think i have ever seen you she replied and yet there is something oddly familiar in your face i have heard my father speak of you constantly i need scarcely say his friends are always mine he bowed to merely speak to lady sibyl elton is counted sufficient to make the man so privileged happy he said to be her friend is to discover the lost paradise she flushed then grew suddenly very pale and shivering she drew her cloak towards her rimenez wrapped its perfumed silken folds carefully round her beautiful shoulders how i grudged him the dainty task he then turned to me and placed a chair just behind hers will you sit here geoffrey he suggested i want to have a moment's business chat with lord elton recovering my self-possession a little i hastened to take the chance he thus generously gave me to ingratiate myself in the young lady's favour and my heart gave a foolish bound of joy because she smiled encouragingly as i approached her you are a great friend of prince rimenez she asked softly as i sat down yes we are very intimate i replied he is a delightful companion so i should imagine and she looked over at him where he sat next to her father talking earnestly in low tones he is singularly handsome i made no reply of course lucio's extraordinary personal attractiveness was undeniable but i rather grudged her praise bestowed on him just then her remarks seemed to me as tactless as when a man with one pretty woman beside him loudly admires another in her hearing i did not myself assume to be actually handsome but i knew i was better looking than the ordinary run of men so out of sudden pique i remained silent and presently the curtain rose and the play was resumed a very questionable scene was enacted the woman with the past being well to the front of it i felt disgusted at the performance and looked at my companions to see if they too were similarly moved there was no sign of disapproval on lady sibyl's fair countenance her father was bending forward eagerly apparently gloating over every detail rimenez wore that inscrutable expression of his in which no feeling whatever could be discerned the woman with the past went on with her hysterical sham heroics and the mealy-mouthed fool of a hero declared her to be a pure angel wronged and the curtain fell amid loud applause one energetic hiss came from the gallery affecting the occupants of the stalls to scandalize amazement england has progressed said rimenez in soft half bantering tones once upon a time this play would have been hooted off the stage as likely to corrupt the social community but now 
the only voice of protest comes from the lower classes. "'Are you a Democrat, Prince?' inquired Lady Sibyl, waving her fan indolently to and fro. "'Not I. I always insist on the pride and supremacy of worth. I do not mean money value, but intellect. And in this way I foresee a new aristocracy. When the high grows corrupt, it falls and becomes the low. When the low educates itself and aspires, it becomes the high. This is simply the course of nature.' "'But God bless my soul!' exclaimed Lord Elton. "'You don't call this play low or immoral, do you? "'It's a realistic study of modern social life. "'That's what it is. "'These women, you know, these poor souls with a past, "'are very interesting.' "'Very,' murmured his daughter. "'In fact, it would seem that for women with no such past, "'there can be no future. "'Virtue and modesty are quite out of date "'and have no chance whatever.' "'I leaned toward her, half whispering, "'Lady Sibyl, I am glad to see this wretched play offend you.' She turned her deep eyes on me in mingled surprise and amusement. "'Oh, no, it doesn't,' she declared. "'I have seen so many like it, and I have read so many novels on just the same theme. I assure you, I am quite convinced that the so-called bad woman is the only popular type of our sex with men. She gets all the enjoyment possible out of life. She frequently makes an excellent marriage, and has—' as the Americans say, a good time all around. It's the same thing with our convicted criminals. In prison they are much better fed than the honest working man. I believe it is quite a mistake for women to be respectable. They are only considered dull. Ha! Ah, now you are only joking, I said, with an indulgent smile. You know that in your heart you think very differently. She made no answer, as just then the curtain went up again, disclosing the unclean lady of the peace having a good time all around, on board a luxurious yacht. During the unnatural and stilted dialogue which followed, I withdrew a little back into the shadow of the box, and all that self-esteem and assurance of which I had been suddenly deprived by a glance at Lady Sibyl's beauty, came back to me, and a perfectly stolid coolness and composure succeeded to the first feverish excitement of my mind. I recalled Lucio's words, I believe Lady Sibyl is for sale and I thought triumphantly of my millions. I glanced at the old earl, abjectly pulling at his white whiskers, while he listened anxiously to what were evidently money schemes propounded by Lucio. Then my gaze came back appraisingly to the lovely curves of Lady Sibyl's milk-white throat, her beautiful arms and bosom, her rich brown hair of the shade of a ripe chestnut, her delicate, haughty face, languid eyes, and brilliant complexion, and I murmured inwardly, all this loveliness is purchasable, and I will purchase it. At that very instant she turned to me and said, You are the famous Mr. Tempest, are you not? Famous? I echoed with a deep sense of gratification. Well, I am scarcely that yet. My book is not published. Her eyebrows arched themselves surprisedly. Your book? I did not know you had written one. My flattered vanity sank to zero. It has been extensively advertised. I began impressively, but she interrupted me with a laugh. Oh, I never read advertisements. It's too much trouble. When I asked if you were the famous Mr. Tempest, I meant to say, were you the great millionaire who has been so much talked of lately? I bowed a somewhat chill assent. She looked at me inquisitively over the lace edge of her fan. How delightful it must be for you to have so much money, she said and you are young, too, and good-looking. Pleasure took the place of vexed amour prop, and I smiled. You are very kind, Lady Sibyl. Why? she asked, laughing, such a delicious little low laugh. Because I tell you the truth? You are young, and you are good-looking. Millionaires are generally such appalling creatures. Fortune, while giving them money, frequently deprives them of both brains and personal attractiveness. And now do tell me about your book. She seemed to have suddenly dispensed with her former reserve, and during the last act of the play we conversed freely, in whispers which assisted us to become almost confidential. Her manner to me now was full of grace and charm, and the fascination she exerted over my senses became complete. The performance over, we all left the box together, and as Lucio was still apparently engrossed with Lord Elton, 
I had the satisfaction of escorting Lady Sibyl to her carriage. When her father joined her, Lucio and I both stood together looking in at the window of the brougham, and the Earl, getting hold of my hand, shook it up and down with boisterous friendliness. "'Come and dine, come and dine,' he spluttered excitedly. "'Come, let me see. This is Tuesday. Come on Thursday. Short notice and no ceremony. My wife is paralyzed, I'm sorry to say. She can't receive. She can only see a few people now and then when she is in the humor. Her sister keeps house and does the honors. And Charlotte, eh, Sybil? Ha, ha, ha. The deceased wife's sister's bill would never be any use to me, for if my wife were to die, I shouldn't be anxious to marry Miss Charlotte Fitzroy. Ha, ha, ha. A perfectly unapproachable woman, sir. A model. Ha, ha. Come and dine with us, Mr. Tempest. Lucio, you bring him along with you, eh? We've got a young lady staying with us, an American, dollars, accent, and all, and by Jove, I believe she wants to marry me, ha, 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 and is waiting for Lady Elton to go to a better world first, ha, ha. Come along, come and see the little American, eh? Thursday, shall it be? Over the fair features of Lady Sybil there passed a faint shadow of annoyance at her father's allusion to the little American, but she said nothing. Only her looks appeared to question our intentions as well as persuade our wills, and she seemed satisfied when we both accepted the invitation given. Another apoplectic chuckle from the Earl, and a couple of handshakes. A slight graceful bow from her lovely ladyship, as we raised our hats in farewell, and the Elton equipage rolled away, leaving us to enter our own vehicle which, amid the officious roaring of street boys and policemen, had just managed to draw up in front of the theatre. As we drove off, Lucio peered inquisitively at me. I could see the steely glitter of his fine eyes in the semi-darkness of the brougham, and said, Well? I was silent. Don't you admire her? he went on. I must confess she is cold. A very chilly vestal indeed. But snow often covers volcanoes. She has good features and a naturally clear complexion. Despite my intention to be reticent, I could not endure this tame description. She is perfectly beautiful, I said emphatically. The dullest eyes must see that. There is not a fault to be found with her, and she is wise to be reserved and cold. Were she too lavish of her smiles and too seductive in her manner, she might drive many men not only into folly but madness. I felt, rather than saw, the cat-like glance he flashed upon me. Positively, Geoffrey, I believe that notwithstanding the fact that we are only in February, the wind blows upon you due south, bringing with it odors of rose and orange blossom. I fancy Lady Sybil has powerfully impressed you. Did you wish me to be impressed? I asked. I? My dear fellow, I wish nothing that you yourself do not wish. I accommodate my ways to my friend's humors. If asked for my opinion, I should say it is rather a pity if you are really smitten with the young lady, as there are no obstacles to be encountered. A love affair, to be conducted with spirit and enterprise, should always bristle with opposition and difficulty, real or invented. A little secrecy and a good deal of wrongdoing, such as sly assignations and the telling of any amount of lies. Such things add to the agreeableness of love-making on this planet. I interrupted him. See here, Lucio, you are very fond of alluding to this planet as if you knew anything about other planets, I said impatiently. This planet, as you somewhat contemptuously call it, is the only one we have any business with. He bent his piercing looks so ardently upon me that for the moment I was startled. If that is so, he answered, why in heaven's name do you not let the other planets alone? Why do you strive to fathom their mysteries and movements? If men, as you say, have no business with any planet save this one, why are they ever on the alert to discover the secret of mightier worlds, a secret which haply it may some day terrify them to know? The solemnity of his voice and the inspired expression of his face awed me. I had no ready reply, and he went on. Do not let us talk, my friend, of planets, not even of this particular pin's point among them known as Earth. Let us return to a better subject, the Lady Sibyl. 
as I have already said, there are no obstacles in the way of your wooing and winning her, if such is your desire. Geoffrey Tempest, as mere author of books, would indeed be insolent to aspire to the hand of an earl's daughter. But Geoffrey Tempest Millionaire will be a welcome suitor. Poor Lord Elton's affairs are in a bad way. He is almost out at elbows. The American woman who is boarding with him. Boarding with him? I exclaimed. Surely he does not keep a boarding house. Lucio laughed heartily. No, no, you must not put it so coarsely, Geoffrey. It is simply this, that the Earl and Countess of Elton give the prestige of their home and protection to Miss Diana Chesney, the American aforesaid, for the trifling sum of two thousand guineas per annum. The Countess, being paralyzed, is obliged to hand over her duties of chaperonage to her sister Miss Charlotte Fitzroy but the halo of the coronet still hovers over Miss Chesney's brow. She has her own suite of rooms in the house, and goes wherever it is proper for her to go, under Miss Fitzroy's care. Lady Sybil does not like the arrangement, and is therefore never seen anywhere except with her father. She will not join in companionship with Miss Chesney, and has said so pretty plainly. I admire her for it, I said warmly. I really am surprised that Lord Elton should condescend condescend to what inquired lucio condescend to take two thousand guineas a year good heavens man there are no end of lords and ladies who will readily agree to perform such an act of condescension blue blood is getting thin and poor and only money can thicken it diana chesney is worth over a million dollars and if lady elton were to die conveniently soon i should not be surprised to see that little american stepped triumphantly into her vacant place what a state of topsy-turvydom i said half angrily geoffrey my friend you are really amazingly inconsistent is there a more flagrant example of topsy-turvydom than yourself for instance six weeks ago what were you a mere scribbler with flutterings of the wings of genius in your soul but many uncertainties as to whether those wings would ever be strong enough to lift you out of the rut of obscurity in which you floundered, struggling and grumbling at adverse fate. Now, as millionaire, you think contemptuously of an earl, because he ventures, quite legitimately, to add a little to his income by boarding an American heiress and launching her into society where she would never get without him. And you aspire, or probably mean to aspire, to the hand of the earl's daughter, as if you yourself were a descendant of kings. Nothing can be more topsy-turvy than your condition. My father was a gentleman, I said, with a touch of hauteur, and a descendant of gentlemen. We were never common folk. Our family was one of the most highly esteemed in the counties. Lucio smiled. I do not doubt it, my dear fellow. I do not in the least doubt it but a simple gentleman is a long way below, or above, an earl. Have it which side you choose, because it really doesn't matter nowadays. We have come to a period of history when rank and lineage count as nothing at all, owing to the profoundly obtuse stupidity of those who happen to possess it. So it chances that as no resistance is made, brewers are created peers of the realm, and ordinary tradesmen are knighted, and the very old families are so poor that they have to sell their estates and jewels to the highest bidder, who was frequently a vulgar railway king, or the introducer of some new manor. You occupy a better position than such, since you inherit your money with the farther satisfaction that you do not know how it was made. True, I answered meditatively. Then, with a sudden flash of recollection, I added, by the way, I never told you that my deceased relative imagined that he had sold his soul to the devil, and that this vast fortune of his was the material result. Lucio burst into a violent fit of laughter. No, not possible, he exclaimed derisively. What an idea! I suppose he had a screw loose somewhere. Imagine any sane man believing in a devil. Ha, ha, ha! And in these advanced days, too well well the folly of human imaginations will never end here we are and he sprang lightly out as the brougham stopped at the grand hotel i will say good night to you tempest i've promised to go and have a gamble a gamble where at one of the select private clubs 
there are any amount of them in this eminently moral metropolis. No occasion to go to Monte Carlo. Will you come? I hesitated. The fair face of Lady Sibyl haunted my mind, and I felt, with a no doubt foolish sentimentality, that I would rather keep my thoughts of her sacred, and unpolluted by contact with things of lower tone. Not to-night, I said, then half smiling, I added, it must be a rather one-sided affair for other men to gamble with you, Lucio. You can afford to lose, and perhaps they can't. If they can't, they shouldn't play, he answered. A man should at least know his own mind, and his own capacity. If he doesn't, he is no man at all. As far as I have learned by long experience, those who gamble like it, and when they like it, I like it. I'll take you with me tomorrow if you care to see the fun. One or two very eminent men are members of the club, though of course they wouldn't have it known for worlds. You shan't lose much, I'll see to that. All right, tomorrow it shall be. I responded, for I did not wish to appear as though I grudged losing a few pounds at play. But tonight I think I'll write some letters before going to bed. Yes, and dream of Lady Sibyl, said Lucio, laughing. If she fascinates you as much when you see her again on Thursday, you had better begin the siege. He waved his hand gaily, and re-entering his carriage, was driven off at a furious pace through the drifting fog and rain. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of the Sorrows of Satan » by Marie Corelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. My publisher, John Morgeson, the estimable individual who had first refused my book, and who now, moved by self-interest, was devoting his energies assiduously to the business of launching it in the most modern and approved style, was not like Shakespeare's Cassio, strictly an honorable man. Neither was he the respectable chief of a long-established firm whose system of the cheating of authors, mellowed by time, had become almost sacred. He was a new man with new ways, and a good stock of new push and impudence. All the same, he was clever, shrewd, and diplomatic, and for some reason or other had secured the favor of a certain portion of the press, many of the dailies and weeklies always giving special prominence to his publications over the heads of other far more legitimately dealing firms. He entered into a partial explanation of his methods when, on the morning after my first meeting with the Earl of Elton and his daughter, I called upon him to inquire how things were going with regard to my work. We shall publish next week, he said, rubbing his hands complacently, and addressing me with all the deference due to my banking account. And as you don't mind what you spend, I'll tell you just what I propose to do. I intend to write out a mystifying paragraph of about some seventy lines or so, describing the book in a vague sort of way as likely to create a new era of thought, or ere long everybody who is anybody will be compelled to read this remarkable work, or as something that must be welcome to all who would understand the drift of one of the most delicate and burning questions of the time. These are all stock phrases, used over and over again by the reviewers. There's no copyright in them. And the last one always tells wonderfully, considering how old it is, and how often it has been made to do duty, because any allusion to a delicate and burning question, makes a number of people think the novel must be improper, and they send for it at once. He chuckled at his own perspicuity, and I sat silent, studying him with much inward amusement. This man, on whose decision I had humbly and anxiously waited, not so many weeks ago, was now my paid tool, ready to obey me to any possible extent for so much cash and I listened to him indulgently while he went on unraveling his schemes for the gratification of my vanity and the pocketing of his extras. The book has been splendidly advertised, he went on. It could not have been more lavishly done. Orders do not come in very fast yet, but they will, they will. This paragraph of mine, which will take the shape of a leaderette, I can get inserted in about eight hundred to a thousand newspapers here and in America. It will cost you, say, a hundred guineas, perhaps a trifle more. Do you mind that? Not in the least, I replied, still vastly amused. He meditated a moment. 
then drew his chair closer to mine, and lowered his voice a little. "'You understand, I suppose, that I shall only issue two hundred and fifty copies at first. This limited number seemed to me absurd, and I protested vehemently. "'Such an idea is ridiculous,' I said. "'You cannot supply the trade with such a scanty addition. "'Wait, my dear sir, wait. You are too impatient. You do not give me time to explain.' all these two hundred and fifty will be given away by me in the proper quarters on the day of publication never mind how they must be given away why why and the worthy morgeson laughed sweetly i see my dear mr tempest you are like most men of genius you do not understand business the reason why we give the first two hundred and fifty copies away is in order to be able to announce at once in all the papers that the first large edition of the new novel by geoffrey tempest being exhausted on the day of publication a second is in rapid preparation you see we thus hoodwink the public who of course are not in our secrets and are not to know whether an edition is two hundred or two thousand the second edition will of course be ready behind the scenes and will consist of another two hundred and fifty do you call that course of procedure honest i asked quietly honest my dear sir honest and his countenance wore a virtuously injured expression of course it is honest look at the daily papers such announcements appear every day in fact they are getting rather too common i freely admit that there are a few publishers here and there who stick up for exactitude and go to the trouble of not only giving the numbers of copies in an edition but also publishing the date of each one as it was issued this may be principle if they like to call it so but it involves a great deal of precise calculation and worry if the public like to be deceived what is the use of being exact now to resume your second edition will be sent off on sale or return to provincial booksellers and then we shall announce in consequence of the enormous demand for the new novel by geoffrey tempest the large second edition is out of print a third will be issued in the course of next week and so on and so on till we get to the sixth or seventh edition always numbering two hundred and fifty each in three volumes perhaps we can by skilful management work it to a tenth it is only a question of diplomacy and a little dexterous humbugging of the trade then we shall arrive at the one volume issue which will require different handling but there's time enough for that the frequent advertisements will add to the expense a bit but if you don't mind i don't mind anything i said so long as i have my fun your fun he queried surprisingly i thought it was fame you wanted more than fun i laughed aloud i'm not such a fool as to suppose that fame is secured by advertisement i said for instance i am one of those who think the fame of millet as an artist was marred when he degraded himself to the level of painting the little green boy blowing bubbles of pears's soap that was an advertisement and that very incident in his career trifling though it seems will prevent his ever standing on the same dignified height of distinction with such masters in art as romney sir peter lely gainsborough or reynolds i believe there is a great deal of justice in what you say and morgeson shook his head wisely viewed from a purely artistic and sentimental standpoint you are right and he became suddenly downcast and dubious yes it is a most extraordinary thing how fame does escape people sometimes just when they seem on the point of grasping it they are boomed in every imaginable way and yet after a time nothing will keep them up and there are others again who get kicked and buffeted and mocked and derided like christ i interposed with a half smile he looked shocked he was a nonconformist but remembering in time how rich i was he bowed with a meek patience yes and he sighed as you suggest mr tempest like christ mocked and derided and opposed at every turn and yet by the queerest caprice of destiny they succeed in winning a world-wide fame and power like christ again i said mischievously for i loved to jar his nonconformist conscience exactly he paused looking piously down then with a return of secular animation he added but i was not thinking of the great example just then mr tempest i was thinking of a woman indeed i said indifferently yes a woman 
who, despite continued abuse and opposition, is rapidly becoming celebrated. You are sure to hear of her in literary and social circles, and he gave me a furtive glance of doubtful inquiry. But she is not rich, you know, only famous. However, we have nothing to do with her just now, so let us return to business. The one uncertain point in the matter of your book's success is the attitude of the critics. There are only six leading men who do the reviews, and between them they cover all the English magazines, and some of the American, too, as well as the London papers. Here are their names, and he handed me a penciled memorandum, and their addresses as far as I can ascertain them, or the addresses of the papers for which they most frequently write. The man at the head of the list, David McAwing, is the most formidable of the lot. He writes everywhere about everything. Being a Scotchman, he's bound to have his finger in every pie. If you can secure McWing, you need not trouble so much about the others, as he generally gives the lead, and has his own way with the editors. He is one of the personal friends of the editor of the nineteenth century, for example, and you would be sure to get a notice there, which would otherwise be impossible. No reviewer can review anything for that magazine unless he is one of the editor's friends. You must manage McWing, or he might, just for the sake of showing off, cut you up rather roughly. That would not matter, I said, diverted at the idea of managing McWing. A little slating always helps a book to sell. In some cases it does, and Morgeson stroked his thin beard perplexedly. But in others it most emphatically does not. Where there is any very decided or daring originality, adverse criticism is always the most effective. But a work like yours requires fostering with favor, once booming in short. I see and I felt distinctly annoyed. You don't think my book original enough to stand alone? My dear sir, you are really, really, what shall I say? And he smiled apologetically. A little brusque? I think your book shows admirable scholarship and delicacy of thought. If I find fault with it at all, it is perhaps because I am dense. The only thing it lacks, in my opinion, is what I should call tenaciousness, for want of a better expression the quality of holding the reader's fancy fixed like a nail. But, after all, this is a common failing of modern literature. Few authors feel sufficiently themselves to make others feel. I made no reply for a moment. I was thinking of Lucio's remarks on this very same subject. Well, I said at last, if I had no feeling when I wrote the book, I certainly have none now. Why, man, I felt every line of it, painfully and intensely. "'Aye, aye, indeed,' said Morgeson, soothingly. "'Or perhaps you thought you felt, which is another very curious phase of the literary temperament. You see, to convince people at all, you must first yourself be convinced. The result of this is generally a singular magnetic attraction between author and public. However, I am a bad hand at argument, and it is possible that in hasty reading I may have gathered a wrong impression of your intentions. Anyhow, the book shall be a success if we can make it so.' All I venture to ask of you is that you should personally endeavor to manage McWing. I promised to do my best, and on this understanding we parted. I realized that Morgeson was capable of greater discernment than I had imagined, and his observations had given me material for thought which was not altogether agreeable. For if my book, as he said, lacked tenacity, why, then it would not take root in the public mind. It would be merely the ephemeral success of a season one of those brief booms in literary wares for which I had such unmitigated contempt, and fame would be as far off as ever, except that spurious imitation of it which the fact of my millions had secured. I was in no good humor that afternoon, and Lucio saw it. He soon elicited the sum and substance of my interview with Morgeson, and laughed long and somewhat uproariously over the proposed managing of the redoubtable McWing. He glanced at the five names of the other leading critics and shrugged his shoulders. Morgeson is quite right, he said. McWing is intimate with the rest of these fellows. They meet at the same clubs, dine at the same cheap restaurants, and make love to the same painted ballet girls, all in a comfortable little fraternal union together, and one obliges the other on their several journals when occasion offers. Oh, yes, I should make up to McWing if I were you. But how? I demanded, for though I knew McWing's name well enough, 
having seen it signed ad nauseum to literary articles in almost every paper extant. I had never met the man. I cannot ask any favor of a press critic. Of course not, and Lucio laughed heartily again. If you were to do such an idiotic thing, what a slating you'd get for your pains. There's no sport a critic loves so much as the flaying of an author who has made the mistake of lowering himself to the level of asking favors of his intellectual inferiors. No, no, my dear fellow. We shall manage McWing quite differently. I know him, though you do not. Come, that's good news, I exclaimed. Upon my word, Lucio, you seem to know everybody. I think I know most people worth knowing, responded Lucio, quietly though I by no means include Mr. McWing in the category of worthiness. I happened to make his personal acquaintance in a somewhat singular and exciting manner. It was in Switzerland, on that awkward ledge of rock known as the Mauvais Pas. I had been some weeks in the neighborhood on business of my own, and being sure-footed and fearless, was frequently allowed by the guides to volunteer my services with theirs. In this capacity of amateur guide, capricious destiny gave me the pleasure of escorting the timid and bilious McWing across the chasms of the Mer de Glace, and I conversed with him in the choicest French all the while, a language of which, despite his boasted erudition, he was deplorably ignorant. I knew who he was, I must tell you, as I know most of his craft and had long been aware of him as one of the authorized murderers of aspiring genius. When I got him on the mauvais pas, I saw that he was seized with vertigo. I held him firmly by the arm and addressed him in sound, strong English thus. Mr. McWing, you wrote a damnable and scurrilous article against the work of a certain poet, and I named the man an article that was a tissue of lies from beginning to end and which by its cruelty and venom embittered a life of brilliant promise and crushed a noble spirit now unless you promise to write and publish in a leading magazine a total recantation of this your crime when you get back to england if you get back giving that wronged man the honorable mention he rightly deserves down you go i have but to loosen my hold Geoffrey, you should have seen McWing then. He whined, he wriggled, he clung. Never was an oracle of the press in such an unoracular condition. Murder! Murder! he gasped, but his voice failed him. Above him towered the snow peaks like the summits of that fame he could not reach, and therefore grudged to others. Below him the glittering ice waves yawned in deep transparent hollows of opaline blue and green and afar off the tinkling cowbells echoed through the still air, suggestive of safe green pastures and happy homes. Murder! he whispered gurglingly. Nay, said I, tis I should cry murder, for if ever an arresting hand held a murderer, mine holds one now. Your system of slaying is worse than that of the midnight assassin, for the assassin can but kill the body. You strive to kill the soul." You cannot succeed, tis true, but the mere attempt is devilish. No shouts, no struggles will serve you here. We are alone with eternal nature. Give the man you have slandered his tardy recognition, or else, as I said before, down you go. Well, to make my story short, he yielded, and swore to do as I bade him, whereupon, placing my arm round him as though he were my tender twin brother. I led him safely off the mauvais pas and down the kindlier hill, where, what with the fright and the remains of vertigo, he fell a-weeping grievously. Would you believe it, that before we reached Chamonix, we had become the best friends in the world? He explained himself in his rascally modes of action, and I nobly exonerated him. We exchanged cards, and when we parted, this same author's bugbear, McWing, overcome with sentiment and whiskey toddy, he is a Scotchman, you know, swore that I was the grandest fellow in the world, and that if ever he could serve me, he would. He knew my princely title by this time, but he would have given me a still higher name. You are not a poet yourself, he murmured, leaning on me fondly as he rolled to bed. I told him no. I am sorry, very, he declared, the tears of whiskey rising to his eyes. 
if you had been i would have done a great thing for you i would have boomed you for nothing i left him snoring nobly and saw him no more but i think he'll recognize me geoffrey i'll go and look him up personally by all the gods if he had only known who held him between life and death upon the mauvais pas i stared puzzled but he did know i said did you not say you exchanged cards true but that was afterwards and lucio laughed i assure you my dear fellow we can manage mcwing i was intensely interested in the story as he told it he had such a dramatic way of speaking and looking while his very gestures brought the whole scene vividly before me like a picture i spoke out my thought impulsively you would certainly have made a superb actor lucio how do you know i am not one he asked with a flashing glance then he added quickly no there is no occasion to paint the face and prance over the boards before a row of tawdry footlights like the paid mimes in order to be histrionically great the finest actor is he who can play the comedy of life perfectly as i aspire to do to walk well talk well smile well weep well groan well laugh well and die well it is all pure acting because in every man there is the dumb dreadful immortal spirit who is real who cannot act who is and who steadily maintains an infinite though speechless protest against the body's lie i said nothing in answer to this outburst i was beginning to be used to his shifting humours and strange utterances they increased the mysterious attraction i had for him and made his character a perpetual riddle to me which was not without its subtle charm every now and then i realized with a faintly startled sense of self-abasement that i was completely under his dominance that my life was being entirely guided by his control and suggestion but i argued with myself that surely it was well it should be so seeing he had so much more experience and influence than i we dined together that night as we often did and our conversation was entirely taken up with monetary and business concerns under lucio's advice i was making several important investments and these matters gave us ample subject for discussion at about eleven o'clock it being a fine frosty evening and fit for brisk walking we went out our destination being the private gambling club to which my companion had volunteered to introduce me as a guest it was situated at the end of a mysterious little back street not far from the respectable precincts of pall mall and was an unpretentious looking house enough outside but within it was sumptuously though tastelessly furnished apparently the premises were presided over by a woman a woman with painted eyes and dyed hair who received us first of all within the lamp-lighted splendors of an anglo-japanese drawing-room her looks and manner undisguisedly proclaimed her as a demi-mondaine of the most pronounced type one of those pure ladies with a past who are represented as such martyrs to the vices of men lucio said something to her apart whereupon she glanced at me deferentially and smiled then rang the bell a discreet-looking man-servant in sober black made his appearance and at a slight sign from his mistress who bowed to me as i passed her proceeded to show us upstairs we trod on a carpet of the softest felt in fact i noticed that everything was rendered as noiseless as possible in this establishment the very doors being covered with thick bays and swinging on silent hinges on the upper landing the servant knocked very cautiously at a side door a key turned in the lock and we were admitted into a long double room very brilliantly lit with electric lamps which at first glance seemed crowded with men playing at rouge et noir and baccarat some looked up as lucio entered and nodded smilingly others glanced inquisitively at me but our entrance was otherwise scarcely noticed lucio drawing me along by the arm sat down to watch the play i followed his example and presently found myself infected by the intense excitement which permeated the room like the silent tension of the air before a thunderstorm I recognized the faces of many well-known public men, men eminent in politics and society, whom one would never have imagined capable of supporting a gambling club by their presence and authority. But I took care to betray no sign of surprise, 
and quietly observed the games and gamesters with almost as impassive a demeanour as that of my companion. I was prepared to play and to lose. I was not prepared, however, for the strange scene which was soon to occur, and in which I, by force of circumstance, was compelled to take a leading part. End of chapter 9